Father, as we come to you today, we're reminded again of the, the place that the Word of God has in our life. We thank you, Lord, that all Scripture is inspired by you and is profitable for correction, for rebuke, and for instruction in righteousness. And so, Lord, we come with a heart that's open to hear what you say to us today and help us to be transformed more into your image, I pray in Jesus' name. For those of you who want a title, I, I always look for uh, something in our meeting that confirms what I've got, and I, I felt I had it today. So um, <clears throat> the title I've made for, for Paul is, uh, What Will You Do? Hebrews 12 says this, it says, Since we have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured the cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. Um, it was interesting as I was putting this together and I thought, oh, that's a familiar scripture and I went back and I actually used it as the opening scripture of my last sermon. So I'm thinking, oh, God, do I bring it or do I use it? And then I thought, well, he's not trying to bring us anything new. He's just trying to get it through, isn't he? Uh, can send a message right around the world in less than three seconds, they tell me, and it can take 40 years to get the last half inch. So um, we've got it again. And I'm trusting that the word will work. In 1 Corinthians 9, and this is by way of introduction, I guess, uh, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 24 through to 27 says do you not know that those who run in a race all run but only one receives the prize run in such a way that you may win now everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything I happen to have a uh, granddaughter that's into running and distance running and it's quite interesting that you um she didn't really do very well in the, in the really short distance stuff because of her stature. Um, she's just not suited to doing that, but she can do distance runs. And having to train for it, having to have the right diet, all of that sort of stuff. It's amazing how we, we sort of gloss over stuff. I, I got blessed actually, this is a little aside, but I got blessed before I was out talking to Max before the meeting and he said um, have you ever thought about the slingshot when when David swung the sling and, and he got Goliath and I said yeah and he said have you ever seen one I said not really and he's got a little video clip out there it's worth having a look at where this guy actually he lines her up and he sends them off and he's pretty accurate so it was amazing a different concept of what I had I used to have a shanghai when I was a kid, and you pull it back, and used to be was good for shooting staples. Um, not just supposed to do that because they're dangerous, but I used to do it anyway because they're already bent. And um, but anyway, that's a little aside. But so we do need to you prepare for what you do. In other words, um, however, those who who run in a worldly race or an earthly race, they do it to receive a perishable crown but we do it to receive an imperishable one. Therefore I do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one who beats the air. Instead I discipline my body and bring it under strict control. And you need to do that if you're in athletics of any sort. There's, there's a certain amount of discipline. Um, sometimes we think of it as a dirty word. Uh, I like... I like the, I think the old King James says, it doesn't say I discipline my body, it says I buffet, I buffet my body. And some people pronounce it as I buffet my body. And that's what a lot of us do. We buffet our body instead of buffeting it and bring it into, into subjection. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 5, um, my voice is a bit croaky today. I, actually, I felt like I'd been run over by a truck yesterday. I, I got a dose of something about... I finished off my message in the morning and, and oh, just after lunch something hit me and I said to Marion, what is it? I'm, God, I had a look at the heater and it's 26 degrees inside and I was shivering. I couldn't get warm. 
ended up putting a blanket on and had the, you know, those one of those rice packs that you heat up and uh, or wet packs, and I just couldn't get blooming warm. But anyway, I woke up this morning. I'm half normal again, so that's not too bad. Two Corinthians ten reminds us this, and I don't know whether this is was applicable to me, but it says, although we're walking in the flesh, we do not wage war in a fleshly way. Since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but powerful through God for the destruction of strongholds, we demolish arguments and every high-minded thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I think in this, in this world that we live in, uh, we'd be foolish not to acknowledge the influence of two opposing spiritual forces. The Bible calls them the law of sin and death and the law of the spirit of life. One wants us to succumb to the, uh, to the flesh, to the natural senses and feelings, and the other one wants us to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 verse 5 says those who live, and I thought this was interesting in light of what Matthew shared at communion. Um, so either I'm in tune or you're in tune or we're both in tune, Matt. So probably I like to think we're both in tune. Um, Romans 8 verse 5 through to 14 says those who live according to the flesh think about the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit about the things of the spirit. I was talking to talking to Andrew before the meeting, and um, we were just kicking around some sort of spiritual stuff. And it's one thing to know our legal position, but it's another thing to outwork it. I know that by his stripes I'm healed. I know that uh, legally I have a right to perfect health, have all that stuff. But the outworking of it sometimes. We have to go through stuff. And uh, I think, like I said the last time when we had a word, sometimes when that mountain comes, we just want that mountain to be removed. But sometimes God wants to take us up over the mountain. And when we go up over it too, as you climb it, you rise to different heights. You get a different perspective on things as you get up higher. And so I think sometimes we can want to escape things when really God wants to, to bring them through us and cause us to grow. And it was interesting, I thought, in Peter's testimony that already he's, he's sensing that somehow God's in this. Now, no way does God intend that he breaks the blue and wrist and do whatever. But the fact is that God, God is a perfect environmentalist, actually. He does not waste a thing. He uses everything. And uh, he has a, a great gift of being able to recycle and reuse things to bring about his good. And that's always good to know, isn't it? Anyway, back to our scripture. It says the mindset of the flesh is death. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace. For the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's law. For it is unable to do so. Those whose lives are dictated to by the mindset of the flesh are unable to please God. That's a scary thought, isn't it? And um, I was actually talking to one of the young fellows outside earlier and he's sort of going through a little bit of a battle. And I said, that's, that's just part of life. And the ideal is that every, every thought is brought under com- captivity. The ideal is that we are so focused on Jesus in life that all those other things just don't happen. But the practical outworking of it is that we, we do fail at times. We do find we fall short. We miss the mark. And so it's important that we, we aim for that perfection. We aim for the ultimate, recognising that we, we're not always going to attain to it. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't aspire to it. Those whose lives are dictated to the mind said of the flesh are unable to please God you however are not in the flesh but in the spirit since the spirit of God lives in you but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ he does not belong to him now if Christ is in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness 
I guess we could um, we could do a whole sermon on that, couldn't we? Um, probably heard one or two over the years. Verse 11 says this of um, Romans 8. I'm sort of rushing a bit, but we'll get there. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. I'll read that again. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, so identify with this, if his spirit lives in me, he's asking the question, he's saying this, if it lives in you, so I'd say to does the spirit of Christ live in you? And the answer is probably yes. Well, he says, then he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. This is something he will do it. It's a promise. So then, brothers and sisters, we're not obligated to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the desires of the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. All those who are led by God's spirit are God's sons or God's children. And so we can identify with that. So having said that, as I guess as the introduction, um, I started with the title of What Will You Do? What lies then behind what you do? What lies behind your actions? First point, um, how do you respond to personal failure? We could go into a, a real lot of stuff with this. Um, after betraying Jesus, Judas actually hanged himself. You can see that in Matthew 7, or Matthew 27, sorry. After King Saul was defeated, he fell on his own sword in um, 1 Samuel 31. David, after committing adultery and murder, repented and cried out to God for mercy in Psalm 51. Interesting interesting factor that I've been reading through the Old Testament and God actually describes David as a man after his own heart and the blessings that went to Israel because of David's heart towards God and yet here we get a glimpse of the the humanity of David where he failed in, and, and he fa failed in a gross way uh, you know, in, in the area of immorality. Um, pretty amazing. I think it was David. One of them had about 300 wives. I don't know how he could keep 300 happy, quite frankly, but um, I don't know how he could even afford them. But, yeah, it's another story, isn't it? Okay, we won't go there. Um, when Jesus told Peter to step out of the boat, and we've heard a lot about this lately, about stepping out of the boat, he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. And guess what? The Lord put out his hand. And he held him by his hand. And you can read about that in Matthew 14. So how do you, how do you respond to personal failure? Secondly, how do you respond to God's dealings with you? This is probably a more interesting one. Um, the story of Jonah is quite interesting. He, he actually... Uh, resisted God's will and he had to face the dealings of God. Scary things, those dealings of God, aren't they? Job reacted righteously to horrendous circumstances and I, was, I still can't get my head around it as I see what, what was actually laid upon Job. And yet he eventually, he was doubly blessed by God. And it's almost like God had sort of singled him out and said, well, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this guy as a demo. I hope he doesn't want to use me as a demo for, to show the devil how wacky he is. But um, he did. So how do you respond to God's dealings with you? I remember I have actually shared it before, but some years ago I, I was in a situation and being as I was in leadership and certainly Phil will identify with this, I... 
I'd actually got a place I just could not face people and, and I had a meeting to go to and I just couldn't face them. And it was a real... I've never been in a, a turmoil like it before and I've never been in it like it since. But um, Marion would certainly remember it because she pleaded with me to go and in the end I didn't go. Uh, I, just, I just couldn't go. But over the years I have I've learnt some things and I... I knew what I had to do. I had, to, I had to go to God and get something from God. And this is what I got from God. It may be relevant to someone here today, I don't know, but in, it took me to Hebrews 10. And this is, this is what he said to me. Do not throw away your confidence which has great reward. If you have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive what it was promised. For in a little while he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we're not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. Within probably 30 seconds, I was fine. Why? Because I got a word from God. He spoke. And... It wasn't that booming voice and sometimes I wish that God would just do it. Uh, but I know even, even with, with Elijah, um, God wasn't in, the, he wasn't in the storms, he wasn't in the thunder, he wasn't in any of that stuff, but he was just in the stillness, he was there. And sometimes I'd like the booming, <laughs> like the clap of thunder and the loud roar, but... That's not how God deals with it. And uh, it was like today, I ended up, when Sophia sung that song, I, I ended up, I, I, got, I must be getting soft, I got tears running down my eyes. And it was just, the Lord was just ministering to me. And, it, and I had a picture, it was sort of like, it was like the Lord was just sort of walking through the chairs and just, and just touching everyone as he went past. There was just such a sense of his presence there. And I just felt so lifted up inside me. And I just had a, an absolute overwhelming sense of the peace of God. So how do you respond to God's dealings with you? How are we going? We're not going too bad. Thirdly, and this is probably relevant to us too, how do you respond to the failings of others when other people let you down? Do you, do you reject them? Uh, you know, I've said it before, that's it, I'm finished with you, never again. Not going to happen again. Do you retaliate? Oh, I'll give them a piece of my mind. Well, I want to tell you, most people can't afford to give any of their mind away. <laughs> Might be, I'll get you back. Do you withdraw? Do you put a fence around yourself? Do you respond like, Jonah's shipmates, they said, throw him overboard. Does self-pity motivate you? It's not fair. Why is this happening to me? You don't know what I've been through. Do you become resentful towards them? So how do, how do you respond to the failings of others when others let you down? And I want to tell you that somewhere along the line, everyone will let you down somewhere along the line. That's what happens. The world has a way of saying it happens. Well, I'm not going to say what the world says, but it does happen. <laughs> Hebrews 12, though, tells us this. He says, pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Now, that's the people that really give you a hard time and the people that don't. He says, pursue peace, not just with the ones that you get on well with, but the ones that give you a hard time as well. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up causing trouble and by it many are defiled. So I want to say to you, it's, it's not God's way to amputate a scratched leg. His way is to bring restoration. 
And everything that God does in any dealings in us or through us, it's all about restoration. One of the key parts of our church vision, restoration. He's wanting to restore us. He's wanting to bring us all to that place of wholeness. How do you respond to the failings of others? Fourth point. I've only got seven points, so I don't know how I'm going to get through them. But anyway, fourth one is do you demonstrate faith in God? And I'll make this one quick. In Romans 8, it says this. We've heard this one already today. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Do you have faith that God will deliver? Philippians 1.6 says we can be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in us will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We have the assurance that God is working in us all the way through. When we feel like it and when we don't. I've heard it said there are two times when we should pray. When you feel like it and when you don't. That's what we should do. Fifth point, do you extend forgiveness? Very interesting passage of scripture in Matthew 18. And um, it says this, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a certain king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he'd begun to settle them, there was brought to him one who owed him 10,000 talents, probably in our day equivalent to millions of, millions of dollars. Since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. The slave therefore falling down prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. I mean he didn't really have much hope of paying him, it was such a ridiculous debt. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him only a few hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him, saying, Have patience with me and I will repay you. It's a wonder he didn't even, those words didn't sort of come back to him from what he'd even given himself. But... Um, it says here in verse 31, So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you entreated me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave, even as I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he, should replay, until he could replay all that was owed him. So shall my heavenly Father also do to you if each of us does not forgive his brother from the heart. What was the end result of that unforgiveness? Well, the end result was actually both parties really were in bondage, weren't they? The one who was owed the money was in bondage and the one who had it owed to was in bondage. So that's an interesting principle in forgiveness, really Forgiveness probably is more important for me to extend to you than it is to be received, really. It's, it's in the extending, it, it does something in me. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit's bound, but somehow it does release the Holy Spirit to do work if I, if I initiate it. And to really forgive someone is to release them from um, any any... Uh, control that I might have over them or any expectation and say, Lord, I let it go. And the beauty of it is, is when I do that, it's God not only does something in me, but then he's free to do something in the person that I've been extending forgiveness to anyway. It says in Matthew 6, if you forgive men for their trans transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. It's interesting in the light of... Um, we know that our salvation is, is by, purely by the grace of God and there's nothing I can do to earn it. And yet, here we see that the attitude that I have towards other people really 
does have an effect on how God deals with me. If I forgive men their transgressions, my heavenly Father will also forgive me. But if I do not forgive men, then my Father will not forgive my transgressions. Difficult text to get around. And forgiving others doesn't condone their actions. It doesn't mean that they were okay. But it does put us in a place where God can not only deal with us, but he can also deal with them as well. So I'd ask the question, how's your forgiveness barometer? Point number six, I'm old-fashioned. I've introduction, it should be three points, shouldn't it? That's what Leo Harris used to teach. Three points and then a conclusion. I usually end up with five or six or seven. Do you exhibit patience? I only need another five minutes. Ephesians 4 says this, Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love. That's, that's the ideal. Uh, I have to say I'm sorry. I, I haven't really reached it yet, but that's what I'm attaining to. So periodically I may say something that will upset you. Um, my, my intention is not to do that, but in my humanity I fall short. But I do suggest that maybe you fall short sometimes too. But the ideal is, as it says in Ephesians 4, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling from which we've, with which we've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Very interesting, we're not told to um, create a, that spirit of unity, but we're told to preserve it. it. That means it's already there. All we have to do is maintain it. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. I guess my question would be, um, sometimes we're not a good judge. I, I used to always say to Marion, like, I, I could never judge whether I really got through or not. But it it's always helps if you've got someone else and say, well, what do you think? And so how do, how do you think others would say that you exhibit patience? How, how do you think that others would, you don't have to answer me, but how do you think others would think about that, about you? Last point is, do you, th do you display mercy? Because it says in Matthew 5, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. James 12 says this, Speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. I'm rather glad about that. For those who have taken notes, you all already have these, but for those who are not, I'm just going to recap them. So I asked the first question was, how do you respond to personal failure? Second was, how do you respond to God's dealings with you? Third was, how do you respond to the failings of others? Fourth was, do you demonstrate faith in God? Fifth was, do you extend forgiveness? Sixth was, do you exhibit patience? Seventh, do you display mercy? Now anyone who knows, anyone who's preached before, knows that um, it's not a matter of pointing fingers at others because when you do that, there's always three pointing back. And I'm probably preaching more to me than I am to you anyway. But I'll close with this scripture and that saves me from having to say too much. In Ephesians 6, it says this, and I'll read it. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And I think that's what the Lord would say to us today. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armour of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. I'm not one who, who really 
Um, I don't think a lot about enemy attacks and that sort of thing. But I tell you what, looking back on, from where I am today, I reckon I had a real attack from the enemy yesterday. I felt like I had been hit by a truck. Now, Peter'd have a fair idea what that feels like. But, but I, I was aching all over, every joint in my body. My legs ached, my hips ached, my back ached, my shoulders ached. I just, I just felt like I'd been hit by a truck. And I look back on it and I... Because there was no way, if I'd have had to preach yesterday, there is no way I could have done it. But praise God, I didn't have to preach yesterday. So you got it today. Back to Ephesians. Take up the full armour of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand, stand firm. Stand firm, having girded your loins with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Interesting, that shield of faith, she's a beauty. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, with every prayer and request, pray at all times in the spirit, with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance in the intercession for all the saints. Heavenly Father, I just want to say today that we love you and thank you. Thank you for speaking to me, but Lord, thank you for speaking to all of us today. I pray, Lord, that you just see all those parts of the word today that have relevance to each one of us, that we might be better equipped as we go out into this world to to see your kingdom established in an, ever, in an even greater way. We just recommit ourselves to you, Lord, and to the task that's before us in Jesus' precious name. Can you say amen to that?